The passage for today is Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Church family, I'm delighted to examine God's word with you today. If you don't already have your Bibles open, please turn them to the passage that was just read, Luke chapter 13. As you turn there, let me remind you of two incidents in recent history. First, on October 1st, 2017, a 64-year-old gunman barricaded himself in his room on the 32nd floor of a Las Vegas hotel. He sent a barrage of bullets into a crowd on the strip, killing 59 people and injuring over 500 more who were attending a country music festival. It was a heinous act. To this day, we don't know why he did it. Second, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, also referred to as MH370, took off from Kuala Lumpur on March 8, 2014. It was headed to Beijing, China. 38 minutes after takeoff, it made its last communication with air traffic control and minutes later was lost to radar. All 227 passengers and 12 crew aboard are presumed dead. The search for the plane is the costliest in aviation history. No one knows where the wreckage is or what caused the plane to go down. If a reporter held a mic up to you and asked you what you thought of these events, what would you say? Would you call these events a tragedy? Would you bemoan circumstances that led to them? What do you think Jesus would have said uh, if he were asked about these events? He might have said, do you think that these people were worse sinners than all the other people in Las Vegas or Malaysia because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, repent, you will all likewise perish. Does that response shock you? If it does, I invite you to think deeply about this passage with us to this morning. As we walk through the passage, ask yourself a few questions. One, what is my reaction when bad things happen? Two, am I able to make a direct cause and effect connection to sin when something bad happens? Three, how can God let bad things happen? And four, how does Jesus want me to respond to tragedy? That's the basic outline for this morning. What is my reaction when bad things happen? Can I make a connection of tragedy to sin? How did God let this happen? And how does Jesus want me to respond? Our passage today starts in Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Luke writes, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. First, we need some background on this passage. The Gospel of Luke was probably written as sort of a legal brief. It explained the teaching of Christians as the Apostle Paul awaited trial in Rome. It showed that Christianity did not directly conflict with Roman interests. Some even suggest it was written in an attempt to secure Paul's acquittal and release. Flip back to Luke chapter 1. Luke starts out, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word who have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for, for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Luke wanted people to have certainty about the things they had believed about Jesus. Most of the people mentioned in Luke would still be alive. Each name and place is like a footnote referenced in a paper written today. 
In the rest of his book, Luke tells us where Jesus came from, how he chose his disciples, and the miracles he performed. Starting in in chapter 6, he focuses on the teaching of Jesus. Luke also sprinkles in references to the government and Jesus' interaction with it. As he continued, the amount of teaching by Jesus seems to increase, just as his conflict with the Pharisees and scribes increased. Jesus spends all of chapter 12 teaching. He tells us not to fear man, but to fear the one who can cast us into hell. Which brings us to chapter 13. Our conversation today does not appear in any of the other Gospels. It is quite possible that the people who brought this story to Jesus hoped he would attack the Roman governor. Have you ever noticed that Jesus always answers the question that should have been asked? The first thing Jesus says is we should not jump to rash conclusions that those who suffer terrible tragedies do so because of their sins. This, is, this helps us answer our first question on our proper reaction to bad news. What is my reaction when bad things happen? Jesus seems to point us to look at our own situations when presented with bad news. To understand this better, let's look at how we think of bad things happening versus how the first century Jew might have looked at the same events. Today, when something bad happens, as in the shooting in Las Vegas, our assumption is not that those who suffered did anything wrong. In fact, we assume that no one does anything wrong uh, except the shooter. Some don't even complain about the shooter. It must be the fault of the inanimate object he was using, or maybe his parents. We either ascribe bad things happening to bad luck, or just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was not the viewpoint of a first century Jew. The assumption was that if something bad happened to someone, it was the direct result of their sin. We can see this in John 9 in the story of the man born blind. Jesus was asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The thought that nothing bad happened unless someone else uh, unless someone else sinned. Long before Jesus' time, the book of Job showed us that bad things happen and are not necessarily tied directly to sin. Turn back to chapter 13. These people in Luke's account have just listened to Jesus teach throughout chapter 12 on responsibility for sin and understanding the times. In verse 1 it says, There were some present at the very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. They had just listened to several teachings on personal responsibility, and then they bring up some news of the day. Apparently, the headlines that morning in the Jerusalem Times, or maybe Israel Today, denounced a brutal attack by Pilate's soldiers on some Galileans that were innocently making their sacrifices at the temple. Isn't that the way it's presented? Does it make sense for Pilate to initiate such an unprovoked attack? It's not likely. Roman history does not record this local event. This kind of thing was, unfortunately, common enough in the ancient world that they surely did not feel the need to write them all down. And perhaps Pilate wasn't eager to document an ugly incident that someone back in Rome might not approve of. Better just to fail to mention it. The Galileans are frequently mentioned by ancient historian Josephus as the most turbulent and seditious people. It seems they often refuse to pay tribute to Caesar and submit to the Roman government. This may be why Nathaniel asked in John chapter 1, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The city of Nazareth was in the region of southern Galilee. So it's possible these Galileans were not as innocent as those telling the story made it appear. Have you ever asked a question or told about an event and not given all the details? Maybe you leave out items that might incriminate the guilty party such as yourself. You might even tell the story with kind of a wink. This is probably what happened here. Some theorize the Galileans were rebels who took refuge in the temple, that Pilate's guard followed them there and executed judgment on the spot. We don't know. It's possible they told the story to Jesus, hoping he'd make some comment critical of Rome that, they could, that would get him in trouble. Jesus saw right through it. In fact, to the listeners' minds, Jesus brings the spotlight on the wrong people. Those bringing the story wanted Jesus to sympathize with the poor Galileans who were slaughtered in the temple. But he surprised them with, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? 
No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, why would Jesus say that? He was not attacking the Romans. He was not really attacking the Galileans. He was telling those that brought the story that they needed to examine themselves. Those bringing the news to Jesus had to think, well, that didn't go very well. Now their minds had to be spinning. In seconds, they could be asking themselves a lot of questions. They were probably thinking, he can't mean this. These men are Jews, even though they were Galileans. They didn't do anything bad. It was the Romans that are evil. You can see it swirling around their minds. We do the same thing when we bring up the story of the shooting victims in Las Vegas. Well, they didn't do anything wrong. They were just at a concert, you might think to yourself. Do we not see ourselves thinking the same way as the crowd around Jesus? When we looked at the first event in our passage, we saw that the Galileans may or may not have deserved, deserved what happened. As we try to understand how to respond to this event, we come to the next part of the passage and ask our next question. Am I able to make a direct cause and effect connection to sin when something bad happens? Jesus doesn't lit up on his audience or us. He doesn't make it easy. His response to the crowd story must have shaken them. He's going to hit them again while they're off balance. Jesus continues in verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. While the Jews might reluctantly agree that the Galileans might have done something to provoke Pilate, surely the victims at the tower had done nothing wrong. Also, the second group is from Jerusalem and not, uh, not Galilee. How can Jesus be saying these things? What is Jesus trying to tell us about these events and similar ones in our day? How can the tower at Siloam compare to the over 200 lives lost in the Malaysian MH370 disaster? We're trying to understand how to think about these tragedies. Are they all being punished by God for doing something wrong? But what if it's just an accident? Didn't the people of the tower just happen to be there when it fell? The reverse is also true in our thinking, and more so in the Jewish mindset. If someone has prospered with material wealth or physical health, they must be blessed by God for being good. This question is often asked, why do bad things happen to good people? If we ask it the other way, why do good things happen to bad people? We might see our own motivations coming to light. We assume that if something good happens, it's because we deserve it. But if something bad happens, it's not our fault. We wrongly assume in our flawed human reasoning that there is always a direct connection in our current world between our prosperity or poverty and behavior. God will judge. His judgment will be true and right, but the consequences may not happen when we can see them. He will do justice, but it may not be until the final judgment at the end of the world. How good was Egypt for the years before and after the children of Israel moved there? For centuries, they were a major world power, the strongest nation in the world. But they were idol worshipers and sacrificed to false gods, suppressing the chosen people of Yahweh. They were not good people, but they prospered. They prospered in this world, but not because of their holiness. In Exodus 9, God says, But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Only then did God destroy Pharaoh and his army. Or consider the Babylonian Empire. It was a greater empire than Egypt. It worshipped false gods and had great wealth and lands. God used it to punish his people by sacking Jerusalem and destroying the temple. They carried off the Judeans into captivity. How do you explain that if you assume that in this life, good or bad things only happen to those who deserve them? While it is true, sometimes there are immediate consequences to sin. Paul warns the Corinthians that taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, uh, he says, For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But other times, we do not see these consequences immediately. Let me tell you a little secret. The reason that bad things happen to good people 
is that there are no good people. Paul painstakingly tells us in Romans 3 that all humans are by nature guilty of sin and condemned by God. Our very nature is overwhelmed by sin. Listen closely to what he says beginning in verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul applies these passages to all of humanity. It condemns those who are religious, not just those who aren't. How many good people are there? No one is righteous. No one seeks for God. Their words are death and deceit. Poison is on their lips and they run, run to shed blood. And the worst thing that can be said is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. How can we say anyone is good? Some might declare, I'm not as bad as others. I've never murdered someone. But that does not excuse you. God does not grade on a curve. His standard is his own righteousness, and it's a pass-fail course. If you do not have the righteousness of Christ, you will not be good enough to escape eternal punishment or the tragedies of daily life. Our third question asks, how can God let bad things happen? How does his plan work in our daily lives? Our vision is too limited to understand God's plan or how he works in people's lives. The theological word for this is providence. The providence of God is defined in one Bible dictionary as God preserving and governing all things by means of second causes. The mode of God's providential government is altogether unexplained. We only know that God does govern all his creatures and all their actions, that this government is universal, embraces all events, and is consistent with his own perfection and to his own glory. Listen once more. God does govern all his creatures and all their actions. That this government is universal, embraces all events, and is consistent with his own perfection and to his own glory. If we hold that every instant is a prompt judgment from God, it would make the providence of God not a holy mystery, but a simple mathematical equation in which all the variables are known. Part of what we are looking at today is understanding God's providence. Biblically, there is no such thing as chance or luck. All events are governed by God. To believe in luck is to, is to declare that chaos, not God, is in charge. If I wish you good luck, I'm saying I hope you have positive chaos. If someone says that they have had bad luck, they are declaring that negative chaos has happened to them. Providence has no room for luck or chaos because God is preserving and governing all things for his glory, which includes working all things together for the good of those who love him. Tell me, is God so simple that you can explain him? To borrow a phrase from Charles Spurgeon, one of the best-known Baptist preachers from the 19th century, if our understanding of God's providence is so simplistic that a child can understand it, then God is not a great depth to dive into, but a mud puddle to splash around in. I could take a child out of the younger equipping class and explain the story of those who died in Las Vegas as a direct result of their going to Sin City. If he then says, yes, I can see that, I have taken the providence of God, which men and women have pondered since the beginning of time, and turned it into two plus two equals four. What a great disrespect to our God. Spurgeon says, But scripture teaches us that providence is a great depth in which the human intellect may swim and dive, but it can neither find bottom nor a shore. And if you and I pretend that we can find out the reason of providence, and twist the dispensations of God over our fingers, we only prove our folly. But we do not prove that we have begun to understand the ways of God. Have you ever walked in on a movie or TV show in the middle? 
Can you explain what is happening or what happened before you came in? If you started declaring in how an early episode of a long-running mystery series will end, your family will consider you a nuisance and your spouse will run you out of the room. The events we see every day that affect the lives of, of us and those around us are the great plans of providence that began over 6,000 years ago. You have been on the earth for 20, 30, maybe 50 years. You have seen a few minutes of one complicated episode of the show involving only those in your small circle of friends. Only God knows the end from the beginning. Only he sees with perfect knowledge all of the actors in the series. A shallow view of the providence of God encourages, encourages us to be the worst of Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group of people during the time of Christ who prided themselves on keeping the law of God. They were so good at it that they added law after law to God's law. They thought they could keep people from breaking God's law by surrounding it with creations of their own. Their actions placed a great burden on everyday people. This view that you can draw a straight line from the event to the cursing or blessing of God will make a great Pharisee of you. Jesus often fought with or condemned them for misunderstanding God and his scriptures. In Matthew 23, he pronounced judgment on them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. We are not better than uh, people than those who died in Las Vegas or the Galileans who Pilate had put to death. Although each of us has been to large public gatherings or sporting events and nothing bad happened, we cannot rank ourselves in God's favor. If so, we could claim that our safety is proof of our righteousness. But I've never read a verse that says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we went to a Texas Rangers game and returned home safely. But if only overt sinners meet with accidents, then we must be very good people. When I hear of accidents or catastrophes, my response is tears and heartache. I do not say, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men who were injured or killed today. Also on this point, the idea that people who die in some great tragedy are flagrant sinners is very cruel and unkind. If this were true, then everyone who died in some extraordinary or terrible manner would be greater sinners than the rest. Wouldn't this be a crushing blow to any survivors? Could you go to a Malaysian MH370 widow's home and tell her, your husband was a worse sinner than the rest of men, therefore he died? Some might argue that even if this premise is not true, it's good to use to keep people from sinning. Let's just tell people that if they sin, God will smite them immediately. Or claim that everyone that dies or is injured in a catastrophe must have been a horrible sinner. What a terrible superstition. While some legalistic Pharisee might use this argument, I don't see how any right-thinking Christian can do so. No one knows why the people died at the tower or why some were killed in Las Vegas and others not, or why all the passengers and crew on the Malaysian flight died, or those... God has not told us his reason. Until he does, we should not impose one on a particular situation. Our response should not be condemnation, but introspection. Why have I been allowed to live? I do not have a free pass from tragedy. Should I not praise God for his mercy that my life was not taken? How presumptuous of us to think God owes us one more day. When we ask our final question, how should we respond to the tragedy? The answer is repent. Jesus has stated twice in our passage that we should not think too highly of ourselves and our response to tragedy should be one of self-reflection and repentance. Repentance. Now, there's a word that everyone avoids today. But Jesus was quite fond of it. He used it regularly. Do not presume upon his mercy. Augustine, an early church theologian, tells us, God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. 
God tells us that we must repent of our sins and turn to Christ. Jesus, just as Jesus told us earlier in the passage, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you think that those Galileans are worse sinners than you? Do you think that those in Las Vegas that night were worse sinners than you? Or those on flight MH370? I tell you no. But how do we repent? Jesus commands it of us. What does it look like? J.C. Ryle, an Anglican bishop of the 19th century, said, True repentance is no light matter. It is a thorough change of heart about sin, a change showing itself in godly sorrow and humiliation, in heartfelt confession before the throne of grace, in a complete breaking off from sinful habits, and an abiding hatred of all sin. Such repentance is the inseparable companion of saving faith in Christ. One of the most notorious sinners in the Bible was also one of its greatest repenters. King David, who God describes as a man after his own heart, sinned flagrantly. He committed adultery and then had a man killed trying to cover it up. Yet when confronted with his sin, he repented. Turn to Psalm 51 in your Bible. This is what repentance looks like. Whether it was the first time you've heard of Jesus, or if you've been walking with him for years, this is how you repent. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 14. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. And you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take, me no, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. Brothers and sisters, Tragedy is all around us. Illness, accidents, financial disasters occur daily. What do we do? At first we ask, what is my reaction when bad things happen? Should we not do as Jesus commands us to do? Repent. Don't be like the Pharisee in Luke 18 who prayed in part, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. But be like the tax collector who cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He went home that day forgiven. Secondly, we ask if we're in a position to make a direct cause and effect connection from someone's sin to some, when something bad happens. Are we like the ones who brought the story of the Galileans to Jesus, trying to make ourselves appear godlier than others? Do we think that we can explain the works of God? Thirdly, we ask, how can God let bad things happen? Every day, the providence of God is seen in the news. Sometimes there is joy and sometimes sadness. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Finally, how does Jesus want us to respond to tragedy? Follow the teaching of our Lord. Repent of your sins. Throw yourselves on the mercy of Christ. Plead the blood of Christ and his sacrifice. 
trust in his resurrection. It is your only hope. If you have believed in Christ, then I warn you not to be puffed up. You have received the mercy of God in Christ. Show mercy to others. Repentance is the expected daily activity of every believer. If you have not believed on Christ for your salvation, I pray that you would do so now. Hear his call. Jesus is not begging you to repent. He is commanding you. He is like the judge of a court issuing a summons. It must be obeyed. Jesus is no longer the mild teacher on the side of a hill. He is the resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords. He sits on the throne of heaven. He is worthy to receive honor. Hear his summons to repent. Believe in his finished work and be saved. Let us pray. Holy Father, may we understand the importance of repentance. As we struggle with understanding your providence, may we see your glory and honor and love in every event. As we study the words of our Lord Jesus, may we not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Please grant us on a daily basis the gift of repentance. All this we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.